my dear listeners, and welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. This is the Finance Friday edition, where we interview Chris and talk about how he should deploy his capital. Should he invest in an exciting business opportunity? And we discuss his long-term outlook on reaching five. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen, and with me as always is my ex Co-host Scott Trench, X. Oh, I thought you meant X like uh, formerly Twitter. I'm excited to get going with you on multiple threads uh, that uh, 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 Chris can follow on his journey to financial independence today. Mindy, how's that for a convoluted tech no intro? That was good. That X is just a placeholder for my new uh, adjective for Scott every single week. But I love it. I love it being relevant, Scott. Thank you. Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, to bring you every money story because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you are starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate or start your own franchise, we'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so you can launch yourself towards those dreams. Next up is a segment of our show called The Money Moment, where we share a money hack, tip or trick to help you on your financial journey. And today's money moment is split your direct deposit into your savings and checking accounts. If you have a hard time saving, this is a great way to automate it. Check with your HR department or online payment system to see if you can put a certain amount in each account. Do you have a money tip for us? Email moneymoment at biggerpockets.com. All right, Scott, I am excited to talk to Chris today because he is a high income earner with a fun business opportunity. That's right. Always, lo- always love these types of discussions. Lots of good options because there's great cash flow um, and uh, lots of lots of fun uh, nuances to his situation that we can explore. And um, maybe you'll relate to a few of them. Chris is a 35-year-old married father, sales professional in the medical equipment industry. He makes a great salary working there, but he also lives in a high cost of living area and wants to make sure that he only embarks on opportunities that drive him closer to his retirement date. I can recognize that. Scott, I bet you can too. Chris, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. I am super excited to talk to you today. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here talking with you guys. Well, let's start off with a little bit about your money history and your money background. Sure. Yeah. So my money story started when I was very young. Um, I'm the son of two rural Midwest farmers who were the first in their family to, to go to college. And so uh, they raised me up to have a strong work ethic. Uh, when I was like five years old, they put me to work in the backyard pulling weeds for one penny per weed that I pulled. Uh, so I was always incentivized to, to work hard to make my money <laughs> and uh, very grateful that they that they did that. Um, I was able to graduate college uh, totally debt free, which is a huge blessing and privilege. Um, I worked through college, I got scholarships, and I had some help from my parents as well. Uh, and then I also uh, worked my way through grad school. And so I was able to, to graduate with an advanced degree with no college debt at all. And I was able to kind of hit the ground running. And um, I got interested in real estate investing when I was in college, uh, grad school, to be precise. And I started with a house hack with some buddies, and that totally changed the trajectory of my life. And thank you to, to Bigger Pockets for, for giving me that initial nudge to, to make the leap. Um, I did that for several years until I got married, and uh, it allowed me to pay off about $150,000 worth of my wife's student loans as well. Uh, on our honeymoon, we sat there in the hotel room and, <laughs> and hit pay. <laughs> um, still had another $150,000 worth of loans to go after that, but uh, we, we chipped away at that. So um, yeah, I've been in Southern California now, which is a high cost of living area uh, for the last six years or so, and looking to try to figure out how I can get to FI as quickly as possible and hopefully try to use some business opportunities to, to do so. Okay. Well, you live in a high cost of living area. If you want to get to FI as soon as possible, is moving an option? If only. Um, my, my wife is from this area and our family is down here now. My family moved here recently to support us as we uh, had our kid and another one on the way here soon. So um, moving to a low cost of living area 
as nice as that would be, doesn't really seem feasible at this point. Um, okay, well, let's run through your numbers really quickly. A salary of about $18,000 a month. I'm going to go with that's not bad, except you're in a high cost of living area, so it's not nearly as not bad as it sounds. Um, your monthly expenses, I'm showing about $12,000 a month, which again, at $18,000 You've got about $6,000 left over every month. You're spending two-thirds of what you make. That's not bad at all. You have a house payment of $4,800 or you know, housing costs of $4,800. Again, high cost of living area. I don't know what you're going to do to lower those. Um, I do see charity at $2,700, food at $1,100, um, auto at $1,100. Definitely going to talk about that. I see a, a, a category called shopping at almost $1,200. Uh, travel, 300 dog, 262 Subscriptions, less than 100 Life and disability insurance, less than 100 Personal care, 150 Miscellaneous, 102 I mean, you're, you're not spending more than you make. You're not even coming close. Uh, I want to know where you're putting that $6,000. Oh, look, here we go. You've got a 401k and traditional IRA totaling $234,000. Roth accounts, 97000 you and your wife combined. Uh, after-tax brokerage, 60000 HSA, 35000 cash, 70 I-bonds, 21 Total debt, I think this is a little bit uh, skewed, but total debt of $700,000 with a mortgage taking up most of that, 668 and a Tesla. Carl's going to kill me if I don't ask you which model. It's a Model 3. Model 3. Tesla at 28,000. So I see a mortgage at 2.625%. I can't tell you to sell that house because you're not going to save any money on your mortgage if you sell that and downsize because all you're doing is getting a smaller house for more money. So um, overall, I think you have a fairly decent financial position. What is your age? 35. 35. Okay. And what is your current job you are medical sales today medical sales yes mm -hmm. okay is that a stable income we, we've listed a salary here can you walk us through how that compensation works sure yeah so well up until last week it was a base salary yeah <laughs> i just started i just started a new job uh this week here um so things will be a little bit different but um better hopefully uh at my prior position, the salary was $67,000, and then about $170,000 of it was uh, variable compensation. And so that would vary between like eight and $12,000 a month in commissions. And then we had these quarterly bonuses that would come out as well. And those could range anywhere from $3,000 all the way up to like $20,000 uh, per quarter. Um, at my new position, the salary is $175,000. And there's an additional $100,000 worth of uh, variable compensation, which is paid out in quarterly bonuses of about $25,000 each. Can we can we just kind of go through at a high level net worth and total assets here and break down of that? Um, we, Wendy went through a little bit of it, but am I, am I right in understanding that about two thirds of your equity that you own, the, the net worth, is in your home right now? That sounds right with just kind of... Back of the napkin math, um, my home equity right now is about seven hundred and fifty ish thousand dollars, and I've got a net worth of probably around one point four, one point five million um, of total net worth. So I think it's about half. Awesome. And, and then the the, the goal here, uh, or would you mind telling us the goal? What what's the outcome you're looking for? Yes. Yeah. So my goal is to be able to retire out of medical sales and move into a job that maybe is in ministry, um, where I'm not relying on a salary, uh, to, to support my family. My wife wants to keep working for a long time, uh, cause she loves her job. Uh, she's in mental health. Um, for me, I think ideally by the time I'm 45, I'd like to have hit my fire number. Okay. And so, and the fire number is what? Well, that's a great question. If you look at like current expenses, um, and use the 25, like the 4% rule, um, it's probably in the low threes, like three and a quarter million. Um, but if you take into account, um, social security and, uh, the fact that by the time I'm like of full retirement age, my house will be paid off. Then 
that drops our expenses and, and whatnot um, by quite a bit. I think I would only need a, a fire number of somewhere in the like 700,000 to a million dollar range. So the goal is to go from here to fire in the shortest period of time. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, and, and play with those variables and, and understanding it. Um, can you walk us through your house situation? You had a $4,800 dollar payment and you've got a uh uh the equity can you tell us what you bought this thing for um and and what's in that payment yeah yeah absolutely so we bought this house in february of 2021 so at kind of in the midst of the pandemic and the craziness that was going on uh we bought the house for one point basically one and a quarter 1.262 uh, million and i put five hundred thousand dollars down on the house uh, we got a mortgage rate of 2.625%. And so our mortgage payment itself is, I think, $2,800 a month, like 2816, I think is the exact number. Uh, and then I have home insurance and property taxes. Uh, the home insurance is, I think, about $1,800 a year. So not horrible. Um, but the property taxes are pretty killer. It's somewhere in the ballpark of between 15 and $17,000 a year. Okay. So we have 15 to 17. That's how we're getting to $4,800 in monthly housing cost. Mm -hmm. I just want to make a first observation here. We have lots more to talk about and go through, but this is really a, 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 a big, this is this, like your strategy. If one's going back a couple of years and looking at it is to, to building wealth is, oh, I'm going to put $500,000 into a house and we're going to uh, uh, pour, you know, I would say a third of my after-tax take-home pay into the payment each month on a go-forward basis. So that's that's something we have to just understand and work around here because like that's, that's a big barrier. That's the biggest impediment to moving you towards that five number. It's going to keep the expense profile that you need to achieve five very high. And it's going to also inhibit our ability to generate cash, which then could be deployed to the next investment there. Um, so with that interpretation, is there, is there any, is, is this a fixed part of the position that we're not going to touch or is it something that we can work with as we get into the rest of the discussion? Yeah, it's, it's pretty fixed, uh, because we are so close to, to family here to, to help with the childcare, uh, which has been, man, absolutely huge. Um, so that, that allows my wife to work two days a week and she earns a hundred thousand dollars a year working those two days. So even though our housing is expensive, uh, the opportunity cost of, of moving, I think would increase our, our other costs, you know, for childcare and the opportunity cost of the amount that she could earn. So in a sense, even though it is expensive, it's also, I think about as low and kind of optimized as I can possibly get it aside from like renting out some storage space under our house or something like that to strangers, which I floated the idea of doing something like that to my wife and she's not down. <laughs> okay. Got it. And now what, what, one, um, one other question here, you you're, you said your wife works two days a week and makes a hundred thousand dollars a year. How, um, how does that work? And, uh, there sounds like a path to being wife fi pretty quick here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so she is a, uh, she works in the mental health field and it's wonderful because she gets to have pretty flexible hours and she chooses her schedule. And right now she's working two days a week. And um, because of the, the nature and the niche of what she does, she's able to make a, a healthy hourly um, salary from that. And once our kids are older and in school um, and the, the need for child care goes down a bit, we can up her hours uh, to maybe four days a week and probably see income around $150,000 a year, I would think. So yeah, so that definitely um, definitely is helpful. <laughs> okay. So so just again, zooming back out here, we, we've discussed the house issue. Uh, total household income, you expect to be $18,000 over the next 12 months. Is that right? Well, I would say it's probably actually going to be higher than that. Um, I'm not great at thinking about things in monthly expenses. I tend to think of things in yearly expenses. So annual is fine too. Let's, let's work it through it annually. What, what do you think you're going to, what do you think you're going to bring home? How much cash can you generate on this $12,000 expense burden that you have here over the next 12 months? So between my salary, uh, and expected with my new job, right? Bringing in 275 a year and my wife, 
bringing in about a hundred a year. That works out to be uh, about thirty-one thousand dollars a month, um, or three seventy-five a year. So when we think about the the total annual housing cost that I have of about fifty-two thousand a year, that works out to be you know only about fourteen percent of my gross income. Now taxes take a big chunk out of that and stuff too, but so thirty-one thousand. We'll say after tax, that's going to be closer to twenty thousand. Um, uh, I'll, I'll peg it at. That's going to give you eight thousand dollars a month uh, that you can that you'll generate on your current expense profile uh, after all of your expenses, and I'll also point out that uh, twenty seven hundred of that is charitable giving, which is awesome, but is totally discretionary. It could be a hundred. I'm sorry, it could be ten, um, uh, uh, eleven thousand dollars a month, give or take. So you have eight, you have ninety six thousand to a hundred and twenty thousand. Uh, dollars in cash that your family will generate per year on a go forward basis. There probably could be more if you paused 401k and other other types of, of contributions. Right. And that's actually something that I wanted to bring up with you is with the amount of money that I have in my retirement accounts right now, I'd always, I guess, let me back up. I'd always thought that the way that you save is just purely in retirement accounts. I never really knew that saving in a brokerage account was a thing until fairly recently. And so I thought, okay, well, it's not going to do me a whole lot of good to have $10 million saved up in my, you know, Roth IRA and my 401k that I can't touch until I'm 59 and a half. But if I want to retire at 45, I've got like a you know 15 year gap of unfunded time. And so that's when I started to put money into my brokerage account, which now I'm at 62,000 in that. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty recent change for me. Uh, so I wanted to, to hear your thoughts on, on how to attack that problem. Okay. So you can access your retirement accounts early and we've had the mad scientist on episode, I think, 18, talking about how to access your retirement accounts early. It's an older episode. The information has been updated when the laws change on his article, how to access your retirement accounts early. But there are multiple ways. There's the um, 72T, which is... That's a substantially equal payments program or something. Yeah, there's substantially equal payments. There's, uh, let's see, there's an early withdrawal penalty, the Roth conversion ladder, 72T, substantially equal periodic payments, and just pay the penalty. Um, But the Roth conversion ladder is one of the best ones. You can just convert over. You do that typically when you don't have any other income or very low income. Um, He goes into it. In his his article, it's fantastic. If you just Google Mad Scientist and how to access retirement funds early, it's the first thing that pops up. And it's very, very well written and very uh, in-depth. Um, and you can also listen to him on our episode 18 because they haven't changed that much, the laws surrounding this. But yeah, there's several ways to access your retirement funds early. However, you're not wrong to... Uh, also save in after tax brokerage accounts um which is a you know just another way to to save you put your money into the 401k especially if you have a company match program um and Scott do you have any ideas or any information about the traditional IRA and the Roth IRA and the conversion ladder stuff for when you start taking money out there's, I need to look into this. I know there's something about that where they start pulling from the traditional IRA and the Roth IRA and the percentages that you own, but I don't have a traditional IRA, so I don't know all the rules about that. Well, I, look, I think, I think Chris, you know, being, you know, being or expecting to be in the uh, top 1%, even in California in terms of household income with your income, um, the, the conversion ladder is not you know, the meat of your, you, you, it, you'll put less than 20% of your discretionary spending, less than maybe 15% of your discretionary spending, even if you max out both yours and your wife's 401k every year uh, in there and do a Roth conversion ladder. The, pl- the question has to be, what am I going to do with this additional 80 to to $100,000 that I'm going to generate after tax uh, every year for the next 10, ideally expanding uh, in order to, to, to achieve 
um, my goal of uh, financial freedom. And right now your asset column is not conducive to financial independence. It's all home equity and, and retirement accounts with $60,000 in after tax accounts and $70,000 in cash. So there needs to be a plan there because you're such a high income earner. I think you would be silly, frankly, to do a very active approach to managing your investments. It's got to be something passive there. And that leads, leaves you with, you know, um, uh, 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 after tax brokerage stocks, like you've been starting, it leaves you with, you know, real estate probably lightly levered real estate somewhere potentially out of state. It leaves you with syndication investments. It leaves you with lending, um, which would be highly tax inefficient in your situation, um, for example. And so I think that's where we've got to, we've got to go. But before we go there um, into the, where, where the, the, the extra cash is going to go, I think we need to, need to dive into the career opportunity here because I think that there's a uh, opportunity to unlock with this, this franchise um, uh, concept that you're, you're alluding to. Can you, can you describe what is, what this franchise is? Is that a way to park the cash? Is it a investment? Is it a job? Is it a hybrid? That's a great question. Yeah. So there's an opportunity that myself and one of my good friends is investigating. Um, we're looking to become partners in investing in a, a franchise or a series of franchises, uh, in the physical therapy space. And the passivity level, I guess you could say, would be probably fairly l low, to be honest. Um, it's going to be a fair amount of work to do. Um, I would be operating pretty remotely, so I wouldn't have as much to do as my business partner, who'd be more boots on the ground. Um, but that being said, it's, it's expensive. It's pretty capital intensive. But assuming that our projections that we've built out are accurate, I think it could be pretty lucrative as well. And so we can, we can dive into to that um, right now, if you'd like. Yes. What is the capital that you personally are going to allocate to this? And how is this partnership going to be split up? Yeah. So we're looking at doing a 50, 50 split on everything, all the expenses and all of the uh, revenues and profits. So to come to the table, it would be about $50,000 per person just to um, enter into the, the franchise agreement. And then uh, to build out each individual franchise location uh, would be somewhere in the ballpark of around um, about $215,000 per person. And we'd be looking at building out several of these over the course of three to five years, perhaps. And so one of my questions is, well, if I have to outlay, you know, about $265,000 in the first year, um, is the best way to fund this via tapping my home equity since I have so much of it? Or is it better off funding it through maybe an SBA loan? Or is there other forms of financing that I'm not even thinking about that might be better. Um, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. So 215 per person, 430 total purchase price. Is that unlevered? Uh, yes. Okay. So any debt on the business could be shared between you and the partner on this. Correct. Okay. Um, and then what is the expected income from this $430,000 business? So yeah, according to our projections, it looks like it would be you know, basically breaking even by the end of year one. Um, so after considering like debt service, we'd probably be at about $25,000 per person after the first year. But then after that, it would be profitable. So we'd be looking at about 150000 per person in year two and about $180,000 per person uh, in year three and moving forward. So let, let's go through this. The business is going to, is going to, not produce any income. What are, what is revenue and expense in year one? Um, give me a moment here. I can pull up my model while he's pulling up that model. We'll just define a couple of terms here. Uh, an SBA loan is a small business association loan. It's a government backed program that allows entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs like Chris here to purchase small businesses often has much more competitive terms than what you can get uh, from other types of lenders uh, is a great option designed to promote small business ownership like this. That's okay. And while you are looking those up, I'm going to ask you 
you said, according to our projections, and I'm just wondering where you got the data for those projections. You said this is a franchise. I'm assuming that the franchise, I, the, the main guy at the franchise has given you information that would help with those projections. Yeah. So the model that we have is basically populated via assumptions, um, such as average number of visits and the average reimbursement that you'll get per visit, et cetera. And then we build out the model of how many patients we anticipate seeing, you know, on a weekly basis. Um, and the assumptions that we populated are based on talking with other uh, franchise owners. So we ask them, you know, how, how often do you see your patients? How much do you get in reimbursement? What's your total profit margin? Uh, and we used those conversations to build out our model. Um, the P and L projections that we built out here show like total uh, revenues at the end of year one to be four hundred and fifty thousand or four hundred and fifty seven thousand dollars, and total costs uh, to be two hundred and nineteen. Well, that's cost of goods sold. Total total cost would be two hundred and forty three thousand, um, plus our cost of goods sold of two nineteen. So that yields a net operating income of basically negative $5,000 in year one. And this is a service-based physical therapy business. So a patient comes in, gets an hour-long physical therapy session. Mm -hmm. So your cost of goods sold is what? Is the paying the therapist and the staff. Great. Okay. And then your operating expenses are going to be the rent for the location? Yeah, exactly. Rent, insurance, um, utilities, all the franchise fees, all of that stuff. What is your partner going to do in this business? He would be um, basically the boots on the ground operating the day-to-day -day of the business, um, managing the staff and uh, being out in the in the field talking to the referring physicians to build up the, the network of referrals. And where's the business physically located? It would be not in Southern California. And is does your partner have physical therapy experience or office management experience? So he is in the orthopedic field. And so he has close relationships with all these doctors who do this referring out to their patients for physical therapy. Uh, and he is an entrepreneur himself. He runs a, a small business of his own currently. So he has management experience and he's familiar with the space. And, and when you say boots on the ground operations, is this person full time in this franchise? It would probably be maybe 20 to 30 hours a week. Okay. So almost full time. What, what, what will your involvement in the business be? How many hours? Yeah. My involvement would probably be somewhere in the range of about 10 hours a week, I would expect, um, doing more of the remote work, such as handling the marketing, setting up, you know, campaigns for that sort of thing. Uh, also helping with some of the personnel management, uh, from a distance. Um, you know, look, I, when I, 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 I you, you, you would know better and with your partner with this, but it feels like you're an investor in this business and your partner, your friend is going to be the operator in the business. Um, if I was your friend, maybe I'm excited about it now, but in year two, I'm not liking this arrangement anymore because I'm doing all of the work in this business and physically operating it and I'm integral to the business. And so I, I wonder if you decide to go in with this business, you should structure it as an investor. And then this person gets a compensation agreement um, uh, and the opportunity to potentially buy you out or have greater ownership stake over time uh, to some degree. So we did talk about that. Um, we talked about, you know, acknowledging full well that he will be putting more time into it than, than I will be. And so what we talked about doing was basically uh, paying him an hourly wage for the additional work that he's doing that split between like if I'm at 10 and he's at 30, we, we would pay him an hourly wage times those 20 hours a week that he's, you know, going above and beyond. Okay. So you're going to invest $215,000 through some combination of debt or equity to earn nothing year one. And then you're going to drive profits in years two and three to the tune of 150,000 to 180,000 each is what you said in years two and three. So this business is going to explode. You're going to go from 450 to well north of a million, million five in order to drive to that, that, that outcome. 
And you believe this. You've done your homework and believe this projection model. Correct, yes. Um, and when do you want to launch this business? What is the timeline? Sometime in the next year is the, is the goal, yeah. Okay, and one year from now, if you were to stop charitable giving or put that on pause for a little bit, if you were to stop contributing to your 401k, I believe you could generate between one hundred and thirty to $140,000 in cash and add it to your pile of $70,000 in cash. I really like that answer for a business that will produce no net cash flow in year one in particular, above getting any type of financing on the business, especially since it'll be operated remotely um, with this, uh, 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 with your structure. How's that sound from an instinctive resp um, answer to your question of how to finance it? So I like the idea of trying to finance it, you know, cash as much as possible. Um, I think I would be unwilling to reduce my giving. It's a, it's, you know, something I believe in deeply. Uh, it's a religious belief that I, that I hold that I want to be tithing 10%. Um, so that part I wouldn't be willing to, to budge on, but in terms of over the course of the next year, taking a hundred percent of my, cash flow that I'm generating and socking it away to fund this specific enterprise, I think I'd be comfortable with that. Okay. The other, you know, other options here, we can take cash from this after-tax brokerage um, account um, and just convert that into cash, pay sm a small amount of capital gains and use that to buffer your position. That puts you at 130 day one. Uh, and it's a pretty short putt to 215 to buy this franchise um, as you, as you're put in, um, after that, uh, from there, but yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I again, I, it's a first time in business. I love the idea of minimizing debt on this particular business, especially since the debt will have so little impact essentially on your return profile, um, based on what you believe here, right? It's, it's either you're going to get, um, a 50% cash on cash return starting in year two on an annualized basis. Um, uh, at, at, you know, that, that, that doesn't really matter if it goes to 65 or 70%. It just adds risk, I think, to that, to that front. So I love the idea of, of being able to do um, a full cash purchase, at least for your portion, if you, can, if you can do it. Can your friend swing that? I doubt it. I don't think so. Okay. So you putting in more cash will create a dynamic where you don't have equal equity ownership. Mm -hmm. Let me, you know, just zooming back out on this. I'm, I'm you know, you, you know the opportunity really well. I'm not really in love with this plan at the highest level because it just seems a little odd to me that a business would have no cash flow in year one and then zoom, you know, and be basically planning to triple in revenue by years two and three. Um, it's certainly possible, um, but I, that, that there's a lot of problems here. It's out of state. Your operations are going to be completely remote, um, probably by definition could be done by anybody. Um, not really going to be specific to your skill set. Your friend is going to be the one that's truly operating the business. And I don't know if I love the the plan to just shift the the hourly wages, right? I think I just wonder in year two or three, if this business does actually perform the way you're talking about it, if there's not some resentment there where it's like, well, geez, I could be making an extra 180 grand a year if I didn't have Chris. Uh, involved in the business. And I think thinking through that in a helpful way with that, that, that acknowledges that reality today and knows that, Hey, here's how we're feeling today, but we're not gonna feel that way in three, four or five years. If things go well, there's gotta be an opportunity. You know, I would love to be a passive investor for 10 to 15% of that business is a home run, right? Of, if you 15% of 300 of, of, a uh, 300 or $400,000 a year in income is a home run on a, on a $200,000 put in. Um, if it actually can sustain at that point in time. So I don't know. What's your reaction to that? Yeah. <clears throat> a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I think the, the cost curve and the revenue curves in those first three years are going to be the most dynamic and change the most. We anticipate this being like a 10 year hold basically. And in years, you know, four through 10, I pretty much anticipate those profits stabilizing at that $180,000 mark. So it's it's basically getting the space essentially ramped up to full capacity. And then once it's at full capacity, there isn't really a ton of additional room to grow that. So that's why you're seeing, I think, what might be looking like untenable uh, profitability 
uh, going from year zero to year one to two to three. Um, and that's just a function of getting the staff in place because every physical therapist that you can bring in, uh, is a, you know, a hundred thousand dollar, basically profit to the owner. If you have the appointments. Correct. And that's where our interviews with other owners and with, you know, my, my business partner talking to his referring physicians, they're all saying every time I want to, you know, refer a patient to PT either before or after surgery, they have to wait two to three months because everybody's so backed up. So we see a huge, you know, um, backlog in, in demand. Uh, and so if we can bring the supply to the market, I don't think there'll be any problems with, you know, meeting that demand. Okay. If there's so much demand, is there enough physical therapists in the area to fill the demand that are looking for other jobs? One of the things that's been popping up lately is, you know, this concept that nobody wants to work and I can't find anybody to hire. And of course you can, you just have to pay maybe a lot more than what you think you were going to have to pay. I have no idea what a physical therapist makes, but if you're planning for 50,000 and everybody's paying 50,000, you're like, well, I guess I got to bump it up to 60. And then you're like, oh, everybody else is getting 60. Now I've got to bump it up to 75. You know, your numbers start to change significantly when you don't have the numbers that you thought you were going in at. Yeah, you're right. And that's, in my opinion, the single biggest risk to entering into this business is the finding the PTs to, to do the work. Because if say that we found a great PT, but then they left, you know, a year in or something like that, I couldn't just step in and my business colleague couldn't just step in because neither of us are trained PTs. So that, in my opinion, is the, the biggest risk to this business. Uh, and we're okay with overpaying somebody to, to bring them over if they're good and they, you know, want to do good work. Uh, you know, based on these numbers, I think that we can afford to pay quote unquote top of market to get somebody really good. Uh, and then, you know, put that risk to bed. Um, does the business have any current revenue right now? No, we haven't opened. I mean, does the, does the franchise overall? Is it, does it, so it does not exist. You'd be buying franchise rights and then entering into a new market. Yeah. Uh, and what does a, uh, mature franchise, if you're going to another market and buy a mature franchise from another owner right now, what would it cost there? That's meeting these expectations. So generating three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars a year in uh, EBITDA. Yeah, we'd probably have to pay a multiple of about six to eight x their EBITDA. Okay, so you, so this you 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 would put in in this case two hundred thousand four hundred thousand four hundred thirty thousand dollars to buy this franchise. Let's say you did it all cash, and in four years, if things went well. You'd have a business that was generating three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars in profit. That would be worth between at a low end, three hundred times six is one point eight million, and four hundred times eight is three point two million. So that's an unbelievable return um, on on an investment. Um, unbelievable is is kind of the word there um, uh, uh, to use on on that front. It is possible, I'm sure. But that is that is a a really really big, big uh, uh, a promise there. That again, I I just be, it seems it seems it seems hard hard to fathom that 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 is that that, that kind of opportunity is is out there. Um, that is in a, from a franchise perspective. Well, yeah, okay. So let me I guess let me step back because I think I answered your question incorrectly. If we were looking to by a, a group of these franchises, then that's when it would be at a, a higher multiple. If we were just going out to to buy a single franchise, the multiple would be probably in the the three to four range. Okay, so still still we're going to generate nine hundred thousand to uh, one point uh, six million in 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 terms of the asset that we're going to build on this on a two hundred uh, on a four hundred thirty thousand dollar put in. Okay, look look if. I guess it comes down to, you know, we're, we're not going to be able, Mindy and I, to really assess the, you know, go, go through the model and all those kinds of things. I think we can bring a healthy skepticism and, and you know the business. You've studied the numbers and all that kind of stuff. If you think this is the opportunity and this is the way, then I just go all in on it. It's, you know, over the next 12 to 18 months and put all of your discretionary cash flow into a bucket 
that will go to this to make it levered as lightly as possible because the return is so incredible that you just described here. Again, you know, within three years, you're going to gen- three to four years, you'll generate an asset that is worth you know, that goes from four hundred thousand dollars in base value to um, nine hundred thousand to one point six million. Um, then, you, then you, I, don't, I, I would say, how do I avoid leverage on that? How do I make it as safe as possible? How do I increase the odds as much as possible and concentrate my bet on that? Uh, and then after that, you know, once you've put, once you've done the put in, you'll have more cash because you'll have cash flow coming from that asset. Then I think it comes down to one of those other more passive strategies um, that we talked about. Is it going to be turnkey or something some, as passive as you can get it out of state rental property investing? Is it going to be some form of lending? Is it going to just be putting everything into VT Sachs? Uh, in your after-tax brokerage, that's an index fund for everyone listening, um, um, or you know, uh, VOO, another just Vanguard, simple uh, low-fee index fund. Um, which of those uh, opportunities? Moving on from the, the business, which of those kind of avenues appeals most to you from an investment standpoint? So I've been a big believer in VTSAX for my whole investing career so far, and it hasn't done me wrong. Uh, so I've. I like that. I've done a syndication before out of state in the Midwest and it didn't go great. Uh, it's not, it, it ended up being fine, but I think it was maybe the deal didn't perform how we thought it would, but it kind of got saved by a, a rising tide lifting all of our boats. If the tide wasn't rising, I think that boat probably would have sank on its own. <laughs> um, but uh, so I'm, I'm, and especially right now, I don't think that syndication in multifamily space in the multifamily space is a great option um, just because of, you know, where cap rates and where interest rates are right now. I don't think that that's going to be a a good spot to park my money. Um, So yeah, I I think, you know, a brokerage account uh, with VTSAX and VOO is, is probably what appeals to me the most outside of the business. Okay. So, so let's just, let's just pop back out here in, in 10 years, which is your goal, right? Uh, give or take, you're going to generate again between 100, 100 and 125 thousand dollars a year. Perhaps scaling a little bit if, if uh, you have a couple of good years in there. Um, scaling even more if the the franchise opportunity goes well. And at that point, you're going to have paid down your mortgage balance. Let's call it by, you know, uh, thirty to thirty thirty more percent. So you have a uh, uh, four hundred thousand some odd and change in, in your mortgage balance. You'll have um, uh, about a million to a million five in accumulated cash that will be dumped basically in index funds across your four hundred one k and IRA, and then you may you may have this franchise, uh, which I'm going to call fifty fifty shot uh, uh, for now. Maybe it's hopefully it's much higher uh, probability um, than that, and and that's that's your position in ten years. That puts you at your phi number, but the question is, does that actually? translate to cash flow that you can then spend at that point in time to realize your goal? Would you be comfortable beginning to start selling off some of that index fund portfolio, for example, uh, at that point in time? How, how does that portfolio sound to you? Because I think it is as simple as that at the highest level for you, despite the complexities with the franchise. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if say hypothetically on that 50, 50 shot, if the franchise does go well, then it would be throwing off, throwing off enough cash to fund our lifestyle, um, for the next 10 years. Um, if it didn't work out, uh, and say it totally goes bust, then the, the money that I have in my brokerage account, I think I would probably have no choice, but to start selling it off. Right. Um, if you wanted to be fi, if I wanted to be fi, Yeah. And, and the other thing as well is, you know, if I did retire out of medical sales and did go into ministry, you know, I think there still would be some level of compensation and my wife would be still working throughout this whole time as well. So if she's making, we'll call it maybe 80 to hundred grand a year, something like that, uh, after tax, um, from when I'm 45 on to retirement age. And if I'm working, in ministry making say $50,000 a year. I think that still would give us enough just income to, to get through those years. Uh, so I probably wouldn't have to sell too much 
uh, from my portfolio, or I could just maybe live off some of the dividends that it generates. No, I I, I think that that I think that's right. I, I, again, I think I think that because at three hundred seventy five k in household income, I mean the game the game becomes very very simple with your expense profile, right? You're just going to generate so much cash over the next couple of years that you will get to your number. It's just the portfolio at the end that I think you need to think through um, to to a certain degree because look, you're, you're gonna hit you're gonna hit the number even if you don't really get that much in the way of returns, just from amortization of your uh, current um, uh, mortgage, uh, elimination of your, your your car payment and uh, the savings that you're going to generate from from the job. Um, I just I just would caution you as you're moving towards that, if the goal is to truly be FI at, at, uh, in 10 years, you know, I, I think you're going to find it hard uh, emotively or behaviorally to actually start selling off stocks and living off of that portfolio to some degree and truly feeling FI and having that ultimate optionality. If your portfolio looks like $2 million in stocks and one, one million, one million, and a half million in um, home equity, that's a hard portfolio to truly live off of. Um, and, and a lot of, and I, I, I know, I, I know no FI uh, individuals who have a portfolio like that, who are actually not generating additional sources of income. If the plan is to generate additional sources of income and be wife fi uh, like Carl, uh, Mindy's husband, then, then that's, that's different as well because you, you, you'll be able to cover those expenses. But I just, I just want to caution you there. And I'd, I'd say, think about that. Yeah. Three and a half million dollars handed to you. Is that how you'd allocate it at the end of that day? Um, uh, options to consider that might be more attractive is just pay off the mortgage. Right, you pay off the mortgage. Now your housing expense goes to goes from forty eight hundred dollars a month to something closer to two thousand dollars a month. That makes things a lot easier. And what you could say, okay, I'm going to put in, you know, I'm going to go to some five percent yield. I can go to a public REIT, you know, or something like that that has five percent yield. Um, that's slightly levered, uh, very highly liquid, and that will give me, you know, if I put a million in there, that gives me fifty thousand dollars. That's actually going to go a long way towards the rest of my my expense profile here, or I'm going to go into Go ahead. You look at me to say something. Yeah. So something that I've thought about as well, a lot is paying off my mortgage at two and a half or 2.625% paying that down early. Um, doesn't seem like a great use of my money just from an opportunity cost standpoint, but in terms of being able to free up cash flow, uh, by having a paid off mortgage and cutting that monthly payment basically in half, like that number gets multiplied by 25 X or whatever, if using the the 4% rule. So I guess that's something I kind of go back and forth on is, well, yeah, it would paying off my house early would technically lower my fire number, but it would also actually be a non optimal use of my money to do that when I could just put that money into like a 5% REIT, like you're saying. That's right. So that, that's going to, that's going to be your challenge. You don't have a math problem here. The math is super simple, right? You generate $375,000 a year and you spend less than a third of that. So you're not going to have trouble from an accumulation perspective. You're going to though, if you want to achieve FI and actually get around this dilemma that I'm telling you, I've, I've seen with tons of other people, like people just don't have a home mortgage, uh, and three, you know, $2 million in stocks, most of which is behind the RRA and truly begin selling off the, the little chunks of equity. They've all got a couple of aces in the hole. You may have that ace in the hole with wife, fi and the ministry work. Uh, and so that's fine if you want to get there, but, uh, just know that that will be a constraint to feeling fi at that point in time. And that's the trap to think through. That could be a trap for, for someone like your situation. You're, you got all the opportunities and wonderful situation and set up in the world. Um, but if you think about, Hey, let's say I wasn't working and my wife wasn't working and I had three and a half million dollars, like surely there's a solution to, to a three and a half million dollar net worth and an allocation of that, that would generate enough cash flow and a low enough cost lifestyle, uh, to meet those needs. That's an easy, but it will be suboptimal. It will, it will reduce the tax efficiency to some degree of your portfolio. It will reduce the long-term net worth, but it will give you that true financial freedom um, a grounding of, you don't have to, you know, depending on any sources of income, um, at that point in time, which may be, may be more valuable to you and your wife than the, uh, the optimal state that you, you know, of not paying off that two and a half percent mortgage and at, at all earlier, 
um, the 10% long-term growth that we all expect from our index funds uh, based on historicals. So if I'm hearing you correctly and thinking through it, you know, I'm a big fan of simplicity, right? That's why I like VTSAX. And so if, if you did just give me three and a half million dollars, said, go do with it as you will set this up in just a beautifully simple world, I would put $1.5 million down on the house and then just have the remaining $2 million in a brokerage account, I guess, um, to throw off, you know, the, the dividends that I would live off of. Um, I'd have to do the math to see what $2 million. That would give you 2% dividends. So that'd be 40 grand. Yeah. And if I didn't have my mortgage expenses and stuff, I think I want to say the number of my annual spending would be somewhere in the round range of like 70 to 80 grand or something like that. So that's halfway there, basically. Say it's 80 grand. So that'd be halfway there just off of dividends. And then I'd basically just have to sell 2% of that 2 million a year. Hmm. Or you could go into a REIT that offers 4% dividend yields um, to some degree, or you could buy rental properties with, you know, put 715,000, 750 into one to three rental properties somewhere in the country that will give you a, you know, a six to 8% cap rate um, um, or, or some combination of the above, right? I mean, you can lend to someone, someone right now, if you were to go buy another house, I presume you have an excellent credit score, great income, um, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, if you were to rebuy this house right now, someone with your position would get a loan for six, $700,000 and they'd pay 7.5% simple interest. So creating, getting that cash flow is not a challenge in today's environment. Um, if you just think about like, oh, I could just like lend to someone exactly like me or buy a mortgage REIT with, that was backed that, 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 uh, had that, that kind of yield there. Um, so that's, that's just the, the create, that's just the, the question I would pose to you. I think that, I think that when you get to that point, the thing that, cause you don't have big problems, you have, you have great problems here. You're going to get to FI, you're going to get to FI and it's going to be great. And you, and you, all you got to do is keep doing what you're doing and you don't have to even be that efficient about it in order to get there. But just when you get there, I think that that something you might find is, Hey, if I'm, if I don't design my portfolio now with that end in mind, I'm going to find it actually quite difficult to truly sell off uh two percent of my equity position at that point in time to live off of it. And you can and and you're gonna be trapped in that situation because it's gonna be very hard to allocate a million dollars in capital gains from your stock portfolio to something that produces a higher income yield if you don't do that intentionally from day one. So that that's just this, those are the question the, the questions I would pose to you because you're in such a strong position and and I think if you think about those you might feel freer even if it doesn't actually change the total net worth number at the end of that journey. One thing I want to point out is that when Scott asked you about your optimal portfolio, you didn't mention the franchise at all. Yeah. Uh, just from the perspective of simplicity, having a $2 million pile of cash that's all in one single VTSAX, um, that definitely appeals to the, the simple beauty and elegance of a of the ideal portfolio. Yes. And as somebody who has a rather complicated portfolio, I can tell you, I uh, long for a really, really simple portfolio. <laughs> We've had lots of conversations about that. So um, a couple more things about the franchise before we wrap up. How many of these franchises are in the US of this brand? And how proven of a track record does this brand have? Um, we haven't mentioned brand names, so I don't know exactly which one we're talking about. Um, I just want, and you don't have to answer these questions for me. These are just something for you to think about, um, you know, going forward. I agree with Scott. I don't love, love, love this idea simply because you and your partner aren't physical therapists. And if your physical therapist quit, you can't hop in and take over. It's not like you have a McDonald's franchise and if your employees quit, you can jump in there and you can figure out that register really quickly and you can go behind. I think you actually have to know how to do everything when you're the franchise owner. So I, I just want you to to think more about the ideas that Scott or, or the, the arguments that Scott made. Because um, I mean, honestly, if we can't talk you out of this, then great. But if we can talk you out of it, then maybe it's not the right investment vehicle. As anonymous as possible. Uh, so there's 
there's a bunch of these uh, clinics that are across the country. And uh, in talking with the other owners that we've talked with, which has probably been, I don't know, between 30 and 50 owner interviews that we've done, they're all, they're all making healthy profits from their businesses. And do they have, uh, do they have trouble finding physical therapists to work in their branches? Or is that a question you haven't asked? That That is, yeah, that seems to be the, and that's why it's my number one concern as well is because that seems to be the hardest nut to crack is how do you, and I mean, it's the same in most businesses. How do you find, attract, retain the top talent, right? That's going to be the same question, no matter what kind of business you're running. Um, it's no different in this field as well, but the difference is that I'm legally not able to hop in if something were to happen, right? Cause I don't have the license. So it's, it's certainly, you know, something to think about, um, and weigh the, the projections, you know, based on the conversations that we've had, they do seem, I don't know. I, it seems quite lucrative to me. Um, it, you know, once you, once you get past the first year, being able to, to have a pretty stable income of, you know, 150 to $180,000 per person for doing not that much work seems, seems solid, but there's definitely a lot of risks to it as well. Well, Chris, this has been a really good conversation. Thank you so much for sharing all this stuff with, with us. And, and, um, we hope, it, hope it was, um, uh, really helpful here. We really, really appreciate you coming on Bigger Pockets Money Podcast today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I really respect you guys and appreciate all you've done in this space. And it was an honor to get to talk with you both. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. We'll talk to you soon. All right, Scott. That was a very interesting conversation. I really appreciated the things that you brought up for Chris to consider with regards to his franchise opportunity. Yeah, you know, I I just think it's it's kind of it's it's interesting here because I think that I mean, look, zooming out to the big picture, and I think Chris disagreed with me a little bit on a couple of these points, but I think the house is the major asset and the major consideration here. This is a 1.5 million dollar asset. It has $800,000 in equity and $600,000 in mortgage balance. We're not willing to work around it, but we have to acknowledge that that is, that is the strategy that is being employed by Chris and Chris's family is investing in this house fundamentally. It is the largest single expense. More money is going towards the house than any other asset. Um, it is more money has gone into the investment than has gone into any other asset. And that is... That, that is that is going to factor in to the path to financial independence. The good news is that we have such a high income, we've been earning such a high income, and we have the opportunity to continue expanding that. That doesn't really matter. We can work around that and begin investing in other asset classes. And I think Chris really needs to think about what he wants that portfolio to look like in a couple of years. And I think that if he does not, he will fall into the trap that too many upper middle class Americans that uh, have the fortune of having and the privilege of having uh, great incomes like he he has uh, fall into, which is all that wealth is in the 401k and the home equity um, and is not really realizable. There's no real freedom there. You're almost uh, even more trapped in that high income uh, treadmill there. Uh, if we don't make an intentional effort to keep expenses low, avoid consumer debt and build uh, spendable after tax cash flow generating wealth in vehicles outside of the traditional 401k and home equity. Yeah. Absolutely. I just am cautious about the ability to hire employees in this still it's getting better, but it's still a difficult time right now. So that's the one of the biggest things. Uh, I would like Chris to consider. Yeah, I, I look, I think within that framework, I just talked about there, we have now this this um, play in the small business category. I love uh, the opportunities in the small business category. Uh, and I think this could work. But we got to I think I think, you know, one of the issues paradoxically that Chris runs into is he earns such a high income that he may find it to his disadvantage to be actually attempting to run a franchise on the side remotely uh, in, in this particular situation. Thing, you know, and he may be very successful with this. He's run the numbers. He's a very careful guy and clearly um, generates a high income, um, cl clearly successful in a lot of ways. But I would feel more comfortable with the franchise opportunity if it was local, if there didn't require, you know, it didn't require specific, you know, uh, physical therapy skill set. 
uh, in order to to get into and operate if there were those back, those kinds of backup plans. I think the, the probability of success would be higher. But with Chris's situation, he is able to generate enough cash on an annualized basis to make a bet like this every two years. So even if he were to make three of them and two of them failed in the next six years, he still might have a winner to this effect. So I think it could still be good math. For That's everybody. a good point. I like that. And again, Everybody's situation is different. So what we recommend for Chris is because of Chris's specific situation. If you have a specific situation that you would like Scott and I to chime in about, we would love to talk to you. You can email Mindy at BiggerPockets.com or Scott at BiggerPockets.com, or you can fill out the finance application, Finance Friday application at BiggerPockets.com slash finance review. And if you don't want to use your name or don't want to use your video or both, we can have you be anonymous. We just want to share your numbers and tell your story. All right, Scott, should we get out of here? Let's do it. That wraps up this episode of the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. He is the Scott Trench. I am Mindy Jensen saying BRB, honeybee. Bigger Pockets Money was created by Mindy Jensen and Scott Trench. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Exodus Media. Copywriting by Nate Weintraub. Lastly, a big thank you to the Bigger Pockets team for making this show possible. Bigger Pockets.